Breaking tonight, just two days after his victory, President-elect Donald Trump heads to Washington to meet with the current president and congressional leaders. But as lawmakers work to ensure a peaceful transition, streets across America are anything but serene, as Mr. Trump's critics once again stage protests, ignoring bipartisan calls for unity, insisting Mr. Trump is not their president, and in some cases even calling for violence. Welcome to The Kelly File, everyone. I'm Megan Kelly. We are keeping our eyes on a number of cities tonight amid calls for more protests in the wake of Mr. Trump's White House win. Just 24 hours ago on this program, we showed you massive demonstrations that were breaking out in major cities across America. People seen burning flags and Trump effigies. Folks in New York even marching to the foot of President-elect Trump's home at Trump Tower. At times, these protests got out of hand and led to arrests. One woman in California taking it a step further. Watch. If we don't fight, who's going to fight for us? People had to die for your freedom where we're at today. We can't just do rallies. We have to fight back. There will be casualties on both sides. There will be because people have to die to make a change in this world. Afterward, President Obama's spokesperson said people have every right to protest, but cautioned that they should not resort to violence. Today, Donald Trump's campaign manager encouraged the president and Hillary Clinton to address the situation. We'll speak with Kellyanne Conway, who's here live in the, about that in a moment. But we begin tonight with Rob Schmidt, who's live in New York City covering the situation there. Rob, what are you seeing? Yeah, Megan, you know, today we saw, you know, President-elect Trump uh, having a cordial meeting with President Obama and a handshake, getting uh, olive branches of some sort extended to him from uh, people like Elizabeth Warren and from Bernie Sanders. But tonight, the uh, objection to this election remains here in New York City, albeit it is much smaller than last night. Last night we saw thousands of people. Tonight, just about 200 people here right outside of Trump Tower. The NYPD has uh, done a much more dramatic job of cordoning off this area here at 56th and uh, 5th Avenue here in Midtown. So uh, it hasn't been what we saw last night, and I think the NYPD was ready for it. This was the same kind of thing, though. They marched up from Union Square. Uh, they did that same about two-mile march into Midtown, uh, just a much smaller group. And I will say that this is a much more on-message group. It appears to be a much more mature group here that we're seeing tonight, people that really are, want to talk about things and want to have a discussion about this and not just scream obscenities and do some of the things that we did see last night on your show. And uh, now we want to come over here and bring in a couple of people that we want to talk to, uh, people that are here protesting and, and, and are, are willing to talk to us about exactly what brought them out here. This is Emily. She lives in Queens, New York, uh, which is just across the East River. And uh, I just want to ask you, I mean, uh, if we can understand as a woman what might worry you about this president. We've heard some of the things he said. What specifically uh, brought you out here tonight at 9 o'clock on a Thursday night? I'm here. I want to change the message. I want to speak to the other side. I hate saying that because I think that this might be possibly furthering the divide, which yeah. worries me. I don't want to alienate the other people. I He does scare me because of the way he campaigned. I'm mostly concerned about the environment. I'm sad that it's become a liberal conservative argument. I think yeah. that everybody needs to live in the world, and I don't want him to undo all of the progress. But I'm hopeful that he will prove me wrong. Right. Um, I just want to let everyone know that yeah. that voted for him that I I don't think all of us think they're all racist and, and bigots sure. and homophobic and I think that um, this is might be sending the message that we think they're all that way. Was there one thing that he said that was the most offensive to you? Was there one thing that bothered you the most? Um, that, that climate that change is not real and okay. not happening in a hoax. So you have a whole different perspective on this thing. I, I, I okay. yeah. you know, I, I think you. that I don't think he's as bad as we think he is, but yeah. okay, I'm, I'm worried. And okay, thank you very much. Thank Emily, you appreciate so it. Much. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, so there you have it. I mean, that's just one opinion of, of several out here that you see. That's the first time I've heard environment as a reason, though. We'll send it back to you, Megan. All right, Rob, thank you. Well, while there are certainly divisions, Donald Trump's victory did make history. And on that night, there was someone by his side who made history as well. Kellyanne Conway, his campaign manager, the first woman to run a successful presidential campaign. There you go, James. Let, let it out. Say it loud, say it proud. She joins me now live. Congratulations. Thank you, Megan. On, on his victory and on yours. Well, I appreciate that. I just think he's a very unique compelling messenger who took his message directly to the people. We 
We're totally impervious to the naysayers, the critics, the polls, the pundits, uh, many in the media, frankly. And, uh, and I'm just glad that I think this is the people's election. I really do. And I feel like my Republican Party was veering dangerously close to becoming the party of the elites for a number of years. And I'm just glad it's the party of the forgotten man, forgotten woman. Well, there's no question that Donald Trump earned this victory, but you also helped. And he had been through two other campaign managers who were not able to get him quite in the space that would prove to be successful. And then Kellyanne came in and managed to help a successful candidate they have a great be his team. best self. And so I know you're sweet. She's giving all the credit to other people because that's how she is. Um, but let's talk about what what your reaction was the other night because we're sitting on the set and you go into those exit poll meetings at five o'clock and they're like right. it looks good for Hillary doesn't right. look good for Donald probably be able to call it in the, in the 11 o'clock hour looks like it's gonna be a Hillary win and these are just data crunchers these aren't partisans right. as just reading what the polls the exit polls have said when was the moment you knew oh my god like he actually is winning he's this he's winning this so our goal was always to protect the core four, as I call it, Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, Iowa. Not an easy feat. We knew Iowa and Ohio, Ohio looked good going into election night, and we knew we were behind in the early vote in Florida and North Carolina, but we weren't as far behind as Governor Romney was in 2012 because we were ready for that. And in concert with the RNC, we built a field operation, a ground game, a data operation uh, that tried to mitigate the loss of early voting that just Republicans tend to experience. We needed a big day of vote in those states. And when we saw that catch up, we knew that we were going to be close, but probably prevailing in both states. The other thing, Megan, is that in, in later weeks, we saw about six different paths to 270. Mm -hmm. But most of those paths ran through the upper Midwest. And we figured, you know, when I saw Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania competitive, and I saw Hillary Clinton not getting over 50%, the thing about her in all of these swing she, states, she, she yeah, never she got had a low ceiling. I, I've been saying that all along. Well, when did you realize Michigan was in play, that Pennsylvania was really in play? Was it Comey? What, what was it? Well, our internal polls, and I know in like public when? polls, at one point? Uh, probably three weeks before the election. I mean, these are, these are states that were always attracted to the Donald Trump message yeah. of renego renegotiating bad trade deals, getting your jobs back from Mexico and China, creating 25 million new jobs, energy and infrastructure investments, So, and patriotism, frankly. Those jobs were always resting it, but he was getting crowds wherever he went, and people were saying, oh, who cares? I called them the wrist flickers. Oh, crowd size, it doesn't matter. It does matter because it Because they didn't the matter for Romney. They didn't matter. Right. That's why. I mean, honestly, if you look at the last election, Mitt Romney's crowd size were huge, not, not consistently in the way Trump's were, but, you know, and he didn't win. So that, you go by history, but in the end, Trump... I mean, not only did he have the huge crowds, but they were motivated and they were, and they were mobilized. They were. And they made the difference. Let, let, let me ask you about uh, on a go-forward basis now. Everybody's wondering about the cabinet. Who's he going to use as his top advisors? You confirmed publicly that you've been offered a job in the Trump White House. Want to give us any hint or forecast what that might be? No, and it's not a specific job. I was just pushing back on a ridiculous media report that I was reluctant to go inside the administration. Gabe Sherman I wanted in New York run, Magazine well, I wanted to run my own. I want to run my own it. business, and people just shouldn't say that without checking with the source. You so know, Gabe Sherman reported me. that without even asking you whether it was true. Correct, and I, I just said false. Maybe the people who are the sources would like, like my job in the White House, but no, that's that's something. It's a conversation I will have with Mr. Trump when it's appropriate, okay. and I've all, I've already told him that I'm what willing do, to serve. What do you think it's going to look like? I mean, because the, the, the names that come to mind: Rudy Giuliani, Chris Christie, Newt Gingrich, Ben Carson, Steve Bannon. All those in the running, as far as you know. Well, I know they've been incredibly loyal to, and they're incredibly capable and qualified to, to take these types of positions. I don't like to speculate on personnel. I think those are personnel or okay. personal decisions. We'll get but, to that soon But the enough. folks that you, that's, that's right. And this is Donald Trump's presidency and it's his cabinet and it's his senior team to name. I just think the major criteria will be loyalty to him. Yeah, he needs to have people agenda. he feels comfortable yes, with. Yes, but then also capable and qualified to do the job. But everybody you just named certainly is. Uh, now let's talk about what we saw there with Emily, the protester. She's fearful, right? And for her, the issue is climate change. And we've heard so many other issues with other people who are out there, women, um, Hispanics, people who are afraid they might get deported, right? Some Muslims, people who found themselves on the other side of Donald Trump's pledged policies or his, you know, behavior at, at some points during the campaign. Does he do anything to reach out to them other than, you know, just try to act presidential? Like, does he do you think he's going to do something where he has a specific message for them? He's off to a great start in that regard, Megan. The minute he won the election and went out to do his victory speech, a speech he wrote, he went out there and he said, I'm going to be the president of all Americans, including those who do not support me. I think that's incredibly important. It's very important to him personally, I assure you. Secondly, less than 36 hours after being elected president in the United States, 
Donald Trump and Melania Trump flew down to Washington to yep. meet with President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama. And I talked Who, it to must Mr. be Trump. said, were brutal to Donald Trump, just as he was to them, but they were brutal right back. But they all love America and democracy, and I know all four of them share an interest in a peaceful transition mm -hmm. into the next administration. We're, we're going to get to that with Charles I, Brothammer, but I will tell you something behold. also that uh, this afternoon, uh, President Bill Clinton called President-elect Donald Trump, and they had a very warm conversation. Oh, God, I'd love to hear that. President Clinton, <laughs> President Clinton um, congratulated Mr. Trump on his victory and wished him well. And so you're hearing that again and again. And I think what I, that's my message to the protesters, too, which is take your cues from these yep. five or six people today, uh, the sitting president, the former president. Keep an open the mind. first lady. Keep, keep an, an open, open mind. mind. And certainly the Trumps, who the said they had a wonderful, rough and fantastic tumble. day they're, there. They're rough and tumble. But during the campaigns, you never liked the personal attacks. You never liked it. Ivanka made clear she didn't like the personal attacks. You know, nobody is a perfect person, and everybody's got flaws. Do you think that as president, that President-elect Trump and President Trump will be able to refrain from that, from going tit, tit for tat with anybody who attacks him and sort of going, you know, to the darkest place on Twitter or otherwise? Now you see his focus. He has his 100-day plan out there, and that's going to be his focus. And he, he also has a Republican House and Senate, which means he can actually get things done. Yeah. I think folks on both sides of the aisle like to hide behind divided government, Megan. Mm -hmm. It's a great foil to fear, frankly, and a lack I of will. I wasn't brave enough to get things done. Well, that, that's right. It's like, oh, I would have except the presence of a different party, or, or I would have except the Congress is in my way. Well, then, you know, here you have a complete control of, by the Republican Party, and the country decided that. They also decided to put Republicans in charge of 69 of our 99 state legislative chambers. Oh, yeah. No, he had he had coattails in many ways, yes. and then the Republicans had a great yes. energy. So but, they'll, they'll be so working we, on that. But, but on this point about reaching out and, and, talk, and talking to people and all. Or just personal attacks. You know, I, can, can we agree, I hope we can agree, that no one has ever been subjected to the deluge and just unbelievable avalanche of personal attacks as Donald Trump. I can just tell you as one of his senior staffers. It's only going to get worse now that I mean, he's my president. goodness, but it, it's nothing like we're the walking wounded. I mean, there's nothing like it. And it's just like the Edward Scissors hands of insults. And, and, yeah. and frankly, I think if Secretary Clinton had not run such a nasty negative campaign toward the end, she could have made the race more competitive. People don't like that. They don't like the paid advertisements well, you know of the insults. know that Trump gave as good as he got. And he gave. But he had a very aspirational, uplifting message in there, too. He did. In his last couple denying weeks, that, especially. But, but my point is, as President of the United States, you know, he can't be engaging in attacks on civilians, verbal attacks or shots like that, and that, that doesn't lift us up. And do you think he's going to stop that? I, I, think, I know that he's fully uh, capable of being the president of all Americans, and he's promised to do that, and that would be included in there. But I would say to those protesters who are burning his image in effigy or who, yep. are, or, or who are, have all these nasty signs, not my president, can you imagine if Hillary Clinton had been elected, which I suppose they were all expecting, and and the Trump protesters were saying not my president yes. or saying that about President Obama. It's all you would hear about. So right. I, I think people should really take some self reflection and realize we got a lot in common in this country. But having said that, he's going to be a tough leader. He's going to make he got elected on a certain issue set, and you can expect him to tackle that very quickly in his administration. We are looking forward to watching the next seventy days and see what your team puts in place, Kellyanne. Thank you. And Amy. to watching you too. Thank you. Congrats. Well, amid signs of